All right, welcome to the Wrinkled Engineer builds. So I'm building a picture frame. This is the picture frame that I built. And I love this picture frame. So it is made of Purple Heart lumber. So this is the natural color. This is not a stain. This is not painted. Uh, this is a lithograph that we picked up like a decade ago for my, for the junior rank of the engineer, for the youngest one. Uh, and it's, we picked up the Purple Heart shoot, four years ago and I got it planed and joined and ready to mill out. And then it moved with us across the country. It has been sitting in the shop um, just right up over there. It's been sitting there for a long time. Uh, it's made out of eight quarter and the original piece was like 11 inches wide, five feet long, ripped it into three strips and was able to, to mill it out. So this video is all about the process of milling this out. Um, it is a combination of one, two, three, four, five router bits to get this profile. Um, and went ahead and stained it or sealed it with a, an oil-based um, polyurethane um, with some UV protection. We used an exterior grade so that it would uh, help keep the color because this color when you first cut it, it's it's kind of a very bright purple, goes a little red, and then kind of back into the purple, and then eventually it'll go into the grays and browns. Um, so the initial color change is oxidation, but then the UV uh, bleaching starts to occur. So hopefully the exterior polyurethane will really slow that process down. Um, I think it's beautiful. I hope you enjoy this build. I had to build a gantry to uh, take my router so I could run my router over the top and keep the, the flat back of the, the frame down as I ran that across, um, which worked really well. Um, it took me, it was a learning curve. I've got a video of the construction of the gantry. It's sitting back there. I gotta find a place to store it, but it's easy to throw up onto uh, my workbench and it's, it's not perfect, but it works for what I, I needed it to. Um, so I'm getting ready to hang this on my, my son's wall. Let's get started. So I'm finally getting around to making this frame. Part of the problem was I needed a gantry for my router so that I can mill this from the top. I got that built a, a few weeks ago and, and I've got some extension collets that I'll use to, to be able to get the, the depth that I need. Um, so it's, it's roughly three and a half inches wide and like an inch and three quarters deep I believe is where we're at inch and five eighths um, so this started out as as eight quarter lumber and it's been planed and I did uh, join it on one side and then ran it through the table saw so I'm gonna cut one of these in half and use this as my template to mill through each step of the process as you can see on screen there is a lot of steps to milling out this molding uh, so the goal is to be able to take three passes on the table saw to get rid of most of the material. I'm going to go do that now. That'll be the first step and then we'll start milling with the router. We start our table saw work with the main chamfer. The purpose of making these cuts on the table saw is to remove a large portion of material easily. Save some time at the router table as well as the life of the cutter on the router bits. To remove the notch in the board, we're going to make two cuts at a partial depth. And you may notice that the first uh, board ran through the wrong direction with the wrong side facing the fence. Uh, this was a mistake, but I'll explain later that it, it worked out. The final cut on the table saw is going to be another chamfer. Alright, so I'm back at back in the shop. I've got all my rough cutting done on the table saw. It's a big boo-boo that I made while I was cutting. So when I was cutting out this notch, I, uh, I had the chamfer side up against the fence, which I probably wouldn't do. Normally I would want the side that's got the most surface and square up against the fence. But I was trying to prevent that if I move, if it didn't stay flat against the, the fence, that it, the cut wasn't hurting me. It was just going off into stuff that was coming off already. So hence, I cut my two template pieces just fine. First piece I flipped through on there, 
I flipped through on the square side and cut it on the wrong edge. The nice thing is I was able to look at the, the profile and if I flipped it, this chamfer didn't impact what I was removing on this side. So when I was all said and done, I just went ahead and ran that the wrong way and then took another chamfer off. And now all the pieces look identical. It means I have the wrong side facing out or, or not the side that I wanted on the out, but that, that's, for a big mistake like that, I'll, I'll take it that I didn't uh, lose the whole project. It was almost shut down right there. I was totally excited to use my gantry, but I looked at the profiles, and since I have a pretty good flat surface that I can use to keep up against the fence, I'm not too worried about um, using the router table as normal. The, the idea is that for the gantry is that I have a big flat surface to keep pressed down. So this is just going to be a simple 45 and then an OG that I went ahead and I took off the bearing so that it would uh, it's going to clear. But I'm going to take a 45 here and then I'm going to work the OG down and that gets me to the base of the 45 or the, the half round that goes there. One disadvantage to using a chamfer bit in this configuration is that the small shoulder on the, the cutter means you can only take small passes and still keep a nice vertical face. So it's been a few days and it's been kind of eventful. Um, I, I did get um, those two profiles done and I started on the top roundover because I finally finally got my set of roundover bits that arrived. I was trying out the gantry and I was doing a, a kind of a questionable cut um, where I was using the fence and sliding it behind the router. So I was being careful with my hands um, and while I was was doing that, it met a little bit of resistance and I pushed it forward and it shattered this piece right here and threw a piece into my eye. And of course I wasn't wearing safety glasses because I was just kind of messing around in the shop and my safety glasses were in the garage. Uh, the eye's okay, had it looked at, had to do some antibiotics, so wear your safety glasses. And then of course, my brothers, who never send me Christmas, or birthday presents, my birthday was in, you know was recently. They both sent me birthday presents and copious amounts of, of safety glasses. So thank you to them. So now I've played with this a little bit more. One of the things I found with the roundover is that if I wanted the full half inch roundover, I didn't cut this OG far enough down to to fully encapsulate that roundover. And I didn't want to go to a smaller round over three eighths wasn't big enough. So I'm in the process of lowering this chamfer and then going ahead and going to lower the OG so that I have the right clearance. Now I have the gantry set up the correct way, which is fence behind, but I'm moving left to right because the router's inverted and cutting on my side of the router, which is nice because it throws the debris that way. I went ahead and cut my long piece into two. It was just getting a lot to manage a 60 inch piece through. Uh, the router table. But I'm not sure if I'm going to go ahead and mill the, the curve out or if I'm going to flip over to this. It doesn't really matter. It works really well having the piece flat against this like I, I figured it would. So, and I had to make some mods to fit the router bits and everything. So it's been a little more time consuming than I'd like, but we're going to hit it and see what we can do. I decided to run the round over bit next. To get a clean shoulder cut, I went ahead and flipped the board vertically rather than running it on its back. To help balance the board, I added a strip of melamine to the router fence. This allowed me to keep the wood nice and perpendicular to the table.
for the lower half of the round over, I switched back to the router table configuration, again with a spacer installed to help balance the wood. Obviously the best solution for a full round over is to use a nosing bit that makes both sides of the half round all at once. This is my poor man's solution. Here's the profile with four of the router operations completed. We move into my favorite cutting profile and that is the cove cutter for making nice beads. We move into a flat cutting bit to level off the surface. Here is the profile with the cove and the flat applied. We've got two more surface profiles left. I added another OG profile, but in order to clear the stock, I had to not only remove the bearing, but also the stem that supports that bearing. I did this with a Dremel tool on slow speed and was very careful not to contact the cutting surface. We finished where we started with the chamfer bit. I was going to reuse the 45 degree bit that I used on the other side of the profile, but I decided to go with uh, the lower part of my cabinet rail cutting bit, which has roughly a 30 degree bevel and a nicer shoulder cutting blade. The final step in the milling process is to add the rabbet to accept the glass, the mat, the picture, and the backing. I chose to go back with the three quarter inch flat cutting bit because it's better and sharper than my rabbiting bit and it doesn't limit me on how far I can go with the width of that rabbit. All right, so everything has been milled out and it's time to sand. And I started, I sanded my, my test piece. One of the challenges with Purple Heart is that as it oxidizes, it turns darker purple. Um, and, and when you first cut it, it comes up more red um, on the purple scale. And then it really starts to brighten up. So when I look at this piece, the stuff that I cut you know, a week ago versus the stuff that was cut three or four days ago versus the stuff that was cut a couple days ago. It's different hues. Um, sanding kind of helped even that out a little bit. Um, but I'm going to have to sand these things and then let them sit until they get to the hue that I'm, I want to kind of lock in, maybe just a little lighter than the hue I'm trying to lock in. Um, so the main, my understanding is the main purpose or the main reaction is oxidation, but then it does also darken with UV. And if you leave it to just continue to, to fade, it will start to turn brown in color, which is not as, as attractive. If you use an exterior grade polyurethane, that will lock in the, the color longer. When I did my kitchen cabinets, I found this great 3M flexible sandpaper. And I can no longer really find it, um, at least not in these rolls. I've seen some in the sheets, but the sheets are really expensive compared to the roll, and I don't know why it's not made anymore, it's discontinued product. It was this ultra flexible 3M sandpaper, so I have a little bit of it, which I'm going to try and use sparingly. Um, I'm just going to have to stick with the normal 
to a 20 sandpaper, I think, for the first pass until I get the sanding sealer on there. The trouble I have with this is it does not conform to the shapes as easily, and so you risk squaring over some of the edges and not getting the roundovers that you're looking for. Um, so, you know, that's just kind of the situation I'm in. finished sanding and clear coating it was uh, I tried to use a sanding sealer on my test piece and it just didn't such a tight grain it didn't really even penetrate so I hit this with some exterior grade varathane oil based semi gloss with two coats 100 or 220 in between and then I went to 400 grit and I did a coat of interior oil based varathane only gloss. And I do like the, the sheen to it. Uh, normally the super glossy stuff I don't like, but I think it really makes the grain kind of pop out. So what we're here to do now is go ahead and cut the miters and once it gets together we'll hit it again with another 400 grit sandpaper, another coat of, of oil based gloss, and then I'm going to go ahead and use biscuits in the joints. I went ahead and took my scrap piece and made them up and they look pretty good uh, and double checked that this thing is cutting at 45. I've got my new 100 tooth blade in here and it cut pretty pretty dang cleanly so hopefully tonight I can get the miter cut so I'll cut both sides this direction set a block to stop it cut the other sides and then do the next two pieces. Um, and hopefully I get to the biscuit tonight. I think I think one biscuit here in the center should be able to hold the biscuit cutter down here um, and that should work pretty well and then just some glue. I don't have a lot of 90 degree clamps especially that are this big um, so I'm not sure exactly how I want to glue the joints up but we'll get to it. picture frame I'm cutting two keyhole slots at the top piece. I put these two lines on the fence to mark the start and stop of my router cut. That didn't sound right. I guess I broke my keyhole bit. Luckily it was within less than an inch or half an inch of the end of the slot so it's good enough. So you learn some things when you look at the Titebond website, like cutting your glue with two parts water to one part glue and using that to pre-saturate the end grain of a glued joint. Wasn't that effective on the tight grain of the Purple Heart, but I could see how this could be useful for pine and oak and other more porous woods. I also learned how to custom tint glue, simply using food safe food coloring. You do want to make sure that you let it dry to make sure that that's the color you want. I think I got this pretty close. Here's what the joint looks like with the glue dried and, and before I cleaned it off with a razor blade. Since the frame is made of such large pieces, I decided to try and use a band clamp to hold the frame together. The trouble I have with band clamps is that they really need a large flat vertical surface to grab, otherwise they roll off, as you can see. It'd be nice if the plastic was, you know, concave or maybe had some ridges or notches on it so that it could actually grab the lip of the frame.
As you can see, it took me several attempts to get this thing to be stable up off the table enough, but eventually it worked. So everyone knows I hate working with glass. I went ahead and fought my urge to treat the glass gingerly and went ahead and just snapped it quickly. And amazingly it worked. For the mat, we're just working with one eighth inch thick mat board. And the mat board and the backing board are the last two pieces. I used one eighth inch eucalyptus white hardboard for the backing. I even got a hand from the senior wrinkle engineer who just happened to be in town. I cleaned the glass, stacked everything together. I used some hot glue around the edge to hold the backing in as well as some tape. Um, I prefer that to glazing points, especially on a piece of artwork that I'm not going to be swapping out of the frame. Purple heart picture frame. Awesome. Thanks for joining me again for this build, for this awesome purple heart frame. Um, heavy duty, I'm hoping that this will be in the family for years to come, um, and I really hope it doesn't fall off the wall because um, it's going over my son's bed. But we've got the keels in the back, so it should be just fine. Thanks for joining the Wrinkle Engineer on today's build. Well, this was, this was many weeks in the coming, but have a good one.